This practice makes the most sense when it's shared, that martial arts is really a communal practice. It's not solely an individual practice. Welcome, everyone. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 666, with my guest today, Sensei Kevin Como. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, show host and Whistlekick founder. And, well, what do we do at Whistlekick? Well, it's pretty simple. Everything we do at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you're interested in what we're doing to that end, please hop over to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. Actually, just revamp the website. And one of the things you're going to find there, well, you're going to find a store where we sell some stuff because, yeah, there are bills to pay. But if you use the code PODCAST15, you're going to get 15% off the stuff there from apparel to events to training programs to protective equipment and a bunch of other stuff, too. We have a separate website for this show, WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. Because we do a lot with this show. We bring you two episodes each and every week. And, well, we do it because we're looking to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help guarantee future episodes of this show, there are lots of ways you can help us out. You could make a purchase. You could share this episode with a friend. Maybe follow us on social media. Sign up for the newsletter. Tell a friend what's going on. Pick up whatever books at Amazon, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Facebook or wherever it seems to make sense, or support us on Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. That's the place to go. You can support us monthly for as little as two bucks. And the more you spend, the more we're going to give you back. Because yes, it's not just a donation. It's a value exchange. We're throwing stuff back your way. Exclusive content that you're not going to find anywhere else. Bonus merch, stickers, shirts, mugs, all kinds of cool stuff, depending on the tier that you're in. And it's all exclusively for Patreon supporters, because, well, you help us, we're going to help you. Today's guest started martial arts in high school, and even as a kid, found some passion for working with kids. And that, right there frames almost everything that we talk about in today's episode, including, believe it or not, working with older folks. Instead of trying to draw those connections for you, I'd rather let Sensei Kevin draw those connections as he unpacks the story of his time training. So here we go. Hey, Kevin, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Good morning, Jeremy. I appreciate you being here. Did you get snow where you are? When I woke up this morning out on the little canoe in our backyard, there was a, a tiny little dusting, <laughs> nice. infectionary, infectionary dusting. That, that, that early snow that most of us look at and go, oh, for, for people down <laughs> south, they don't realize how dramatically different our opinion of snow changes, how, how much it changes over the course of a winter. No, it's, uh, it's um, I'm welcoming it. I mean, I, I see all these folks on social media lamenting the arrival of snow. But I'm, I'm ready. Do you ski? Are you are you an outdoor snow person? I do ski. Yeah, I, um, I bring the kids. My wife and I bring the kids skiing. We have a, a few nice local areas up here: Suicide Six and the Dartmouth Ski Way near where I live. And uh, it's it's a great way to get out there with the kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, my kids are at the age where they are trying a little bit of everything, and um, skiing is just a, a great joy. So nice. I'm hoping we get enough to get out there. Nice. Yeah. Th- there's. When, when the weather's right and the conditions are right and everything just kind of clicks, you know, there, there's that feeling going down the mountain for, for listeners who may not have skied or may not have reached that level of, of skill skiing. There's just, there's something that's pretty magical about that flow down the side of a mountain. Yeah, I, I get your say. The, it, it's a beautiful feeling. It's the same feeling that, you know, you get with well done martial arts, that, that flow is such a peak experience. Hey, you you took my transition from me. Great. This is good. I'm going to have an easy time today. I'll just set them up and you can knock them out. So Jeremy, welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to talk to you today. But... That's where I was going with it. There, there's something really similar when when you're firing on all cylinders, isn't there? That, that it, it feels effortless and yet it's still powerful. 
it's a really beautiful thing. Um, you know, and I recognize it in, in sports a lot. I, I speak with my clients. I was telling you a little bit earlier that my regular day job is doing massage therapy, including sports massage. I have a lot of clients who are athletes in different sports. And, and I hear them, you know, no matter what sport they're in, it's something that they're all going after. You know, whether it's golfers or runners, they're looking to hit that beautiful sweet spot where you get that sense of effortlessness. You get that sense of energy and expansion. Your whole body feels like it's bigger than it really is. Mm. It's, uh, it's this beautiful universal thing that we're all going after. You know, some of us through martial arts, some of us through other avenues. Absolutely. Now, this is a martial arts show. And we tend to look for the foundation and build from there, not only in conversation, but in history. It's a pretty natural way to go. So let's do that. You know, yeah. what's your start point? Where's your origin story with your training? That's a, a great question because today, or right around today, just happens to be my 39th anniversary of starting martial arts. Cool. Happy anniversary. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking back to when it was right around mid-November 19th that I started. So it's nice to have this show today that we're recording it today uh, on this anniversary. And it was a happy accident, I guess I would say. I was a high school student, not involved in much except skiing, which we were mentioning earlier, and other things. And a, a friend in high school asked, asked me one day, hey, I'm going to a, a karate class on, on Tuesday night. Do you want to come? And I didn't have a, a good reason to say no. So I thought, yeah, why not? <laughs> so. Um, so I went along, you know, with no expectations and no plans. And then 39 years later, here I am, still here. Do you remember that first class? I, I remember a little bit about it. It was in a little, like so many dojo around the country, this humble little basement studio with a concrete floor and iron pillars and a, a ratty old rug. Yep. And, uh, and it was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful to me. There's a heavy bag hanging up and, you know, I, I gave it a whack and thought, well, that hurts. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I met my instructor, who was a nice guy and big muscles and, and tattoos, just a, you know, super friendly guy. But I thought, well, this, this is a different human being for me. I think, I think there's something I might be able to pick up from this guy. He is, uh, he is really unlike me in a really compelling way. You, you recognize that even at that age? I think I did. Maybe it's selective memory, but uh, maybe I'm ascribing too much wisdom to my 15 year old self, but <laughs> that's okay. Re revisionist but history. I just tell, yeah, he was, he was really different. Um, and over time he came to represent to me. I'm not sure what the right word is. Um, a little bit of uh, toughness, but, but in a, in a really good way, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that invested in toughness as a general concept, but he, you know, so he helped over the course of my high school years take this kind of content and doughy white kid, you know, living in the suburbs and, you know, start to get me in shape and, and teach me some interesting things. Like, what, what's it like to, be, to get hit? You know, what's, mm. <laughs> what's it like to, uh, to tangle with somebody? What's it like to, uh, to firm up a little bit? You know, I, so martial arts was really responsible for me. I, when I entered martial arts, I was a bit bit overweight as well. So I eventually lost that weight and kind of transformed me into a couch sitting, Cheeto eating, Looney Tunes watching suburban kid into, you know, somebody who was really invested in health and wellness and, uh, and being able to stand up for myself. Mm. The way you're talking about this man makes me wonder how much of your willingness to stick around in the early days was the material and how much was him? That's a good question. I found the material compelling. Um, unlike some of the other physical activities I had been involved in, you know, say skiing or riding my bike around or just playing out in the forest behind my house, this was new. This this structure was new. You know, there are kata and there are drills and there are exercises. And I was used to that sort of thing in my academic life in school, you know, having to do homework and exercises. And, and it was really appealing to me. So the, the material was certainly an appeal. He was appealing too, because I think I had had the stereotype before that tough guys, this fellow was a kickboxer and a jail guard and all sorts of 
of different things. He was a really impressive figure. Um, but it helped me kind of get rid of that stereotype that a tough guy is not a nice guy because he was really sweet and wonderful and comical and helpful. He had all these wonderful attributes that went along with his, his martial toughness. And um, so I, I definitely found his personality compelling as well. What was the next, um, let's call it transition point, maybe at graduation? Did you move away, go to college? What was there, or, or did you stick around and keep yeah, training? I guess, I'd say there are two, tra- two transitions. Well, yeah, three transitions in there. I started, and then two things happened before I graduated and went off to college. That was certainly a transition. But one was uh, before I got black belt, just before I went off to college, um, I got my showdown, my first black belt from him. And that was a really wonderful transition. It signified to me, wow, I guess I really am serious about this stuff. Mm. I'm going to stick with it and study. Um, that traditional notion that when you get your first black belt, this is, this is the beginning. Now you're a serious student. You know, you're not an expert. You're not an instructor. Now you're showing that you're, you're a devoted student at this point. So that was important. But before that happened, something really deeply important to me happened, which was that about a year and a half into the practice, he handed over his kids program to me. Mm. So I was about 16 and a half or 17. I wasn't that old. And I had been helping him out with the little kids class. As I said, I was a teenager. And, and I liked it. And I liked working with the kids. And at one point, he asked me if I was interesting, interested in taking it over. I later found out that he didn't actually like kids. <laughs> <laughs> so there was an ulterior motive on his part. To, uh, to hand this off to me, somebody he saw as trustworthy, and good with the kids. I was able to do something that he didn't particularly want to do. So at age, as I said, 16 and a half or 17, I found myself running the kids program at my school. So that was really a big transition. That was as big a transition for me as getting my first black belt or then Sounds heading good. off into the world. Because it, it gave me something to be devoted to beyond my own practice. I started to realize around that time, oh yes, this, this practice makes the most sense when it's shared, that martial arts is really a communal practice. It's not solely an individual practice. You, you realize that even at that age? That's a powerful realization. I, yeah, again, I think what I realized about the import of that moment probably came more in retrospect. I'm able to talk about it and make sense of it now. At the, at the time, I don't know if I, I realized how important that was. Okay. I was just having kind of fun making kids do push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me. People who teach martial arts or really anything to children, I don't think I know anybody who is indifferent to teaching children. They either absolutely love working with children in, in some specific age groups, or they yep. absolutely despise working with <laughs> children. And, and again, even particular age groups. I know people who like to work with three to five-year-olds, but not, you know, 11 to 15 oh, sure. or something. <laughs> no, it's very true. And um, the blessing for me at the time was that I had no idea that I could learn. Hmm. <laughs> so I had a certain confidence born of ignorance. Um, that oh yeah sure i can i can run kids classes and i'll just copy what he was doing when i was watching him teach the kids classes um but i'm really glad i started that early because since i've stuck with children's martial arts education from my adulthood i feel like i got my a lot of my errors out of the way at a time when since i was young and close in age to the children it was very forgiving um, I think if I made mistakes with the kids, the kids naturally forgave me mm-hmm. because I was still young myself. Um, you know, the parents weren't holding me to too high a standard either. Um, but I really liked it from the start. I, I think I saw, you know, a little bit of myself in the kids and thought, oh, how great. Wow. I started age 15. You know, this kid's starting at six or seven. What a, what a cool thing. So it's always been appealing and and when I went off, you know, you asked about transitions. I did, of course, graduate from high school and headed off to college. And in college, I kind of missed it because there were no little kids around for me to work with. I, when I went off to college, I looked around for 
karate. You know, at the time, my first school was a Kempo karate school, and I looked for something similar on campus. And they didn't have anything. They did have a Taekwondo club, so I worked out with them for a few years. Um, but I definitely missed being with the kids. So I think one thing that was important about the college years was reminding me that, oh, it's, you know, this that really felt fulfilling. Uh, that's a missing aspect. I want to get back to it as soon as possible. Mm. And did you set out to make that happen, or was it more of a, a you know, this will this will come back around when it's time? What happened there, and, uh, you know, you can make the argument that I was working with kids when I was working out with the Taekwondo Club, because we were all kids, really, sure. still, at that age. But near the end of my undergraduate experience, I met, uh, I, I started to look around in the community. The campus didn't offer what I wanted. So I looked around in the local community, which is up here, and found the fellow who had become my mentor and my sensei, uh, which is Ron Treem, who, you know, your buddy Andrew knows very well, mm -hmm. since Andrew studied with us when he came up uh, when he was living up in this area. And I joined Sensei Treem School, and, you know, he became this magnificent figure from, you know, so so kind uh, and yet so capable at the same time, uh, sort of a different mix of what I had in my first instructor, um, somebody who is both a fantastic human being and a fantastic martial artist as well. And of course, in his school, he had a kids program too. So at that point, I was able to re-engage not only with my own practice and start to learn uh, a more appealing form of martial arts than I had done in my school, but also, as I said, get back to working with kids as well. And what next? Next, you know, next, after um, I was able to, to work with Sensei Train for a while, I graduated. And of course, I didn't stick around this area. I eventually came back to this area after four or five now, years. Now, when you say I, this area, where do you mean? Oh, sorry. So I'm in White River Junction, Vermont. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, so I was with Sensei Train School up here. And then embarked on a few years of traveling around, as many people do after college, and headed out to the West Coast. And lived in Tacoma for a year, lived in Phoenix for a year, lived in, came back and lived in Boston for two years doing my massage training. And in all those spaces, I was looking for uh, martial arts, because at that point, I really felt invested. But I don't know if you've ever traveled around a lot and, and bounced around a lot, but it's it's very frustrating. So when I had worked with Sensei Dream, I found his approach and the arts that he was teaching so appealing. And then I moved. And like when I went to college and only found the Taekwondo Club, which wasn't my primary art, I worked with it for a while. Similarly, when I went out to the West Coast, I looked around and found an Ishin Ru school, which I worked with for a few months, which was nice, but it wasn't quite what I was looking for. And a fellow doing Shotokan and then went to Phoenix and found, found a Gojuru school, which is the style that I do like. Um, but then I was only in Phoenix for a year with this wonderful school. And then I moved again and went to Boston and had to start the search all over again. And one thing that time period taught me was uh, the value of your own internal drivers. Because if you don't have a home base, if you don't have a, a home school, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of focus to keep up with your practice. In the absence of a stable instructor who you have available to you, school available to you, it's really hard to keep up with the practice. It, it takes a lot of commitment. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I failed. Uh, went several months at times without really training. Um, but I always missed it and knew I would get back to it at some point. So after all these years of traveling around, I finally settled in with my fresh massage degree in hand back up here in the Upper Valley and was able to reconnect with Sensei Dream and, and then spend 30 more years training with him. So I definitely uh, had that time period of wandering. <laughs> Do you think you needed to go through that? I think it was really helpful. So... I think one thing it gave me was an appreciation and a perspective. Um, one phrase that I learned from a, a professor in college, which I've always retained and, and really delighted in, 
is the phrase crack detectors. <laughs> so in the context of the, uh, the course I was taking in college, you know, the professor was using it to re refer to you know, developing part of adulthood, developing that sense of what's true and what's BS. Mm -hmm. And having trained with, I thought, a really great instructor to start out with and then connecting with Sensei Treem, when I headed off to the West Coast and then back to Boston, I probably took part for some time in half a dozen different dojo, everything from Aikido to Ishinu to Goju to Shorokan. And some of the instructors were really fantastic and some were really not. Um, so I think getting that breadth of exposure to different dojo and different approaches, different styles, different, different everything, um, refined my my craft detectors and gave me a great sense of, of what was worth pursuing, what was not. So yeah, I'm glad I went through that period. Okay. Now you, you, you made a comment and, and I think I heard it correctly. It sounded mm -hmm. like there was a finality to Sensei Treem and to your time with him. Yeah, he, he retired a, a short time ago. Um, but then he's he's recently got, got back into martial arts okay. training, so I'm looking forward to reconnecting. My my schedule is really tough right now, um, so it's been hard to connect with him. But hoping to do that. So in the meantime, I've been running a children's program here in White River Junction, um, which you know it's been interesting with um, getting back in the swing after after recent events yeah. with the kids. It's been really fun to to get the kids going here. So I have a small group going. Um, I don't have any adult classes, particularly, but I'm offering some women's self-defense classes and pretty much mainly focusing on the kids right now. But one thing that's uh, transpired in my, my current expression of martial arts is, very importantly, a few years ago, I picked up Tai Chi as a secondary practice. So most of my martial arts training has been in karate and also some Japanese jiu-jitsu and a little bit of judo. But I picked up Tai Chi when I turned 50, which is now close to five years ago, and added that to what I do and started to uh, learn enough Tai Chi to be able to lead basic classes in it. And that's become a real joy in my life. So that you know, as it's come out, I find myself these days in terms of my, not my own practice necessarily, but in my instruction, focusing primarily on the very young and the very old, hmm. because as you know, Tai Chi has a reputation for drawing a lot of elderly folks yeah. because it helps so much with balance and coordination and things like that. So it's become really fascinating to me to compare and contrast what I'm doing with those two different groups, you know, working with my, my group here, which are primarily from age four to 11 or 12 uh, in the program I have here in White River Junction. And then working in Tai Chi, and in the Tai Chi classes I lead, there are people of all ages, um, but of course, a large portion of them are older in their 70s and 80s. <clears throat> and I'm teaching one class a week uh, at a local place with a, an independent living for, for older folks, where all the students exclusively are in their 80s and 90s. Now I'm 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 curious. I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. so you found fairly early an affinity for teaching children, and it, it mm -hmm. you didn't quite say it this way, but it sounds like there was at least some in, intention in not offering adult classes at this time. You know, maybe partially time available, but um, a lot of martial arts schools will, will shoehorn that in wherever they've got to because. For a lot of instructors, teaching kids pays the bills and teaching adults is their passion. Right, right. But then we we skip forward, I don't know, 60, 70 years in human development, <laughs> and you you pick up this other group. So where's the synergy there? I'm I'm sure it's in there. Yeah, it's um you know part, part of what I'm limited by right now is schedule. Um so I have my own little kids who are ages uh, 6, 10, and 11. And so one thing that's really tough for me with all of their schedules is that I'm largely not free after about 5 or 5 p.m., which is when you're 
typical adult class takes place. Yep. So with a Tai Chi, I've been able to find a place, uh, find that I'm successfully able to offer it during the daytime, and there are people who can come. And of course, when you're working with an older population who are by and large retired, they have the time and flexibility to come there. Okay. So yeah, it's not. Um, I find working with all ages appealing. Um, logistically, I find myself right now most easily working with the, as I said, very young and very old. Okay. And and, and keep going. Tell us more. Yeah. One thing you know, I was thinking about this before the show today. I was um, thinking how it's, it's interesting that so much of my focus right now is on what you might call martial arts at the beginning and end of life, mm. and there's so many people in martial arts who sort of focus on those dynamic middle years with adolescents and young adults. Um, and, you know, of course, that's the age category I'm in. I'm right in the middle, you know, age 54 or so. Um, but, what, but I find it really interesting to think of what the arts can offer to the very young and to the very old. So, for example, I was thinking of. Um, I was thinking of the respect involved. I was, um, I had a, had a very interesting conversation, a short conversation years ago when I had a chance to take a day long seminar with Morio Higayona, who's a, you know, very famous Goju instructor. And I wanted to ask him, because this isn't the kind of thing I've heard. I, you know, in martial arts, I hear so much about what's important in working with adolescents and adults and so forth. But I don't hear a lot of people talking about kids and what's important to kids. And since that's one of my one of my focuses, I wanted to hear his opinion on that. So I had a chance to ask him through an interpreter, his wife, um, his English is not that great. I, you know, I said to him, well, what, you know, you've heard, I, I, I never hear people talk about Budo, you know, working with Budo with children. And What's, what's your opinion? You know, what's the most important thing when you're working with children trying to teach children Buddha? And his answer, you know, again, being you know, one of the most famous martial artists on the planet was etiquette. He went right to that answer. And he said, the main thing you need to do with children is to work on the, on the etiquette to get that sense of respect established so early. And he said, in addition, you need to put a lot of effort into making sure the parents are on board. So whatever you're trying to do in the dojo with teaching respect to children, you know, make sure that it's being backed up at home. Talk to the parents about how they can support that. You know, and I was I was just so fascinated by that response. You know, he could have said anything, you know, within the whole realm of martial arts, but but it all boiled back down back down to that. And, you know, it's interesting because when I, when I work with the older folks, <clears throat> the respect is, it's just there. It's, it's great. Um, when I work with the kids, I think the respect is there. It just needs to be shaped. Um, at some point, I haven't done this uh, so far in my teaching, but I would love to create an opportunity to do some instruction with the kids and the old folks together. Mm. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was going to ask you, what do you think would happen? It sounds like it's more uh, experimental. That would I have no idea what that. I think it would be a, a complete hoot. It's a good word for it. <laughs> I, I think everyone would enjoy it, but who knows what comes out of it? <laughs> it's true, it's true. But you know, when I've when I've been working with the the young folks and with the elderly. Um, I think I've recognized beyond the art and the curriculum of the arts themselves <laughs> that exploring exploring martial arts really taps into something for the young and the old and everybody in between too, which you know I think is a fundamental need. Maybe it's the deepest need of people, which is the need to belong. You know, people want to feel valued. They want to feel like they're attached to something important. You know, that's bigger than themselves. You know, with the kids. You know, I don't want them to feel like they belong to my program because they wear a certain patch or they get a trophy or even if they 
stick, you know, they're the best hit at sticking to my agenda. So I want them to feel like they belong because they have this inherent value as a child. I think that's something that all kids need to hear. And when I, you know, transpose that into the elderly population, you know, one thing that pains me is to see how in our society, the elderly are often cast aside and not valued. You know, they're thought often to be too old to be of any use. But I see that same need there, that need to belong to something that's really important. Um, so that's, you know, that's really fascinated me to, to use martial arts as a way to get people to, to have this group <coughs> that they can belong to and, and get some value with and feel this wonderful camaraderie. You know, the, I'm teaching a class, as I said, at this local elderly independent living place. And it's the most marvelous thing. You know, these six or seven folks show up every week, as I said, they're between 80 and 90, or sometimes in their 90s. And they have a marvelous time with each other. And obviously teaching Tai Chi with that age group, I'm not really focusing on the martial side of martial arts. You know, it's Tai Chi mostly for balance. Um, I do talk about the martial side of it just for their, their interest. But, you know, there are some similarities even with that group. You know, they have this wonderful camaraderie. They feel important. But at the same time, uh, oh, there is a self-defense component, even when you're 85 or 90 or 95. And what they're learning is to defend themselves against decline. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're at that age, things... Very often, they're not working so well. You know, one person's knee is off, another person's hip is unreliable, another person uh, is forgetful and can't remember the next step in the form, you know, from moment to moment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's, um, I don't know, it's just, it's been a really marvelous thing. So I think, I think even there, there's that sense of, of self-defense. You know, the, the enemy for the older folks is not external. You know, for them, it's, again, it's that tricky need, you know, can I learn to shore my defenses up against something happening there? Yeah. Quite often when I see adult programs, especially adult programs that may have a good chunk of older adults, you know, when, when we think mm -hmm. of a typical adult, quote unquote, adult martial arts program, we've got everything from, you know, 12 or 14 in, in a lot of schools up through. But if we were to look really closely at those ages, they do, at least it, when we're talking about that age demographic you're working with, it's a mm -hmm. lot. It's a lot younger. You know, an old, quote, an old person in most martial arts schools is going to be 40 or 50. Right. And when I see people come in who are older, I, I remember I had a gentleman start, this is years ago when I had my school, and he came in at 72. Mm. And I'm thinking a lot about Rod right now. His name is Rod. And mm -hmm. he brought a childlike attitude to it. He wasn't so much focused on getting it right. He was focused on showing up, having fun, learning, building some relationships. He was deaf as a door to boot. <laughs> so, you know, I'd be shouting at him, not because I was mad, but because I was trying to get him to Just hear me. Yeah, yeah, from across the room. And when I when I think about him, when I think about other older folks that I've seen in, in classes, and, and, I, and I promise I'm bringing this back in a moment. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people teach older adults as simply adults who are less capable and the frustration can come through from the instructor. Uh, it sounds like, and I'm wondering if this is the heart of the synergy for you, mm -hmm. you're leading with something else. If you, if anybody who teaches kids, successfully teaches kids, leads from mm -hmm. joy. I've never seen an, yeah. an instructor who's great with teaching kids anything who does not find a great deal of joy in it. Mm -hmm. And just the way you're describing some of these folks who are limited in some ways. I'm going to guess there's a lot of joy in there for you and you're giving them permission implicitly to feel joy in their practice. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's very true. And um, yeah, when I go into that, 
that, you know, it happens in my my other Tai Chi classes, which have more mixed age group, but specifically when I go into that group that's exclusively 80s and above, I go in both assuming nothing, you know, I assume no, no competence, no capacity, um, you know, sometimes not even the ability to stand on your feet for more than five minutes at a time, you know, because some of them get very tired and have to sit down, some come in with walkers. And since I start from zero with no assumptions, at that point, it's all exploration. So when they come in, like, all right, I can take a good guess at what's not working in your body and in your life right now. Let's start with what is working. You know, let's find, let's find something you can do and build from there. And to me, that's a much more positive and a much more joyful approach than taking, um, you know, the paradigm of problem. It's like, oh, oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? So, you know, I do the same thing in, in my massage therapy, actually. You know, when you do therapeutic massage like I do, you're used to people coming into the office and giving you a litany of what's not working. Oh, my rotator cuff. Oh, my stiff neck. Sitting in the computer. On and on and on and on. And then as the massage therapist, you're expected to, to do something to try to fix it. Yeah. But I learned something really valuable a long time ago from a great figure in the massage field who said, you know, given, I'm paraphrasing, given that folks will tend to show up at your office focused on what's wrong, it's good to remind them that if they arrive at your office on any given day under their own power, you can assume that there's more going right with that system than wrong. That's important. So it's it's an important it's mindset. A really important, it's a really important mindset to me that, you know, let's start from what's really working here. And what I notice with the folks, you know, who show up at the Tai Chi class, the older folks is when they walk walk in the room and we have this camaraderie that I was talking about before. They, they have their crew, you know, they found a little group that they can belong to. You know, they might come in with a walker or they might come in um, limping or, you know, having forgotten their hearing aids or something like that. But they come in and what they leave with is a smile. And we start from there because they're really happy to be there. And I'm really, happy. you know, it's really, it's, it's, it's really quite marvelous. And I think, you know, to tie this back to the concept of self-defense, if, you know, so many people think that martial arts is supposed to improve your capacity for self-defense. Again, you know, we're not practicing Tai Chi as a martial art with this older group. But what's happening is they're shoring up their defenses, not just against, you know, a knee that might betray them or a hip and their balance, but against loneliness too you know they're forming this wonderful bond with each other and with me so that it's something we all look forward to every week and that defends against loneliness it defends against isolation those are the things that really kill folks um so to me it actually makes perfect sense to qualify that as a self-defense class i, I agree I, I think quite often the definition of self-defense becomes hyper narrow and honestly, I think a lot of the people who uh, who get tunnel vision on self defense just don't want to do forms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how could how could I justify not that. doing these things that I don't like anymore? Right. Oh, I'm a. I'm a it doesn't matter. I'm a self defense <laughs> practitioner. Uh, you know, interestingly, on the other side, just for a moment to you know to flip it back to the please. kids. Um, you know, because as I said before, you know, with the with the older folks, practical self-defense, you know, defending against that person who's going to jump out of the bushes and try to grab them, it's really not their concern. It's really not their concern. And when I think of the kids, you know, with the kids, there is more of a point, I think, in focusing on more practical self-defense pieces. But with kids, because they're still developing as human beings, the techniques are important, the curriculum is important, skills are important. But to me, what's really important with kids is to help them develop or find the self that's worth defending. You know, they need to find out who they are first, because I think the foundation of self-defense isn't the techniques. You know, that's a vehicle that's going to help you, you know, learning good techniques for self-defense. But you're not going to apply those until you have this fundamental sense that you are a self that's worth defending. 
So, and that to me is what Budo, you know, doing martial arts education with children is really about, is to shore up that sense of self, which to me is more important than any individual technique to learn. And how do you do that with those young kids? Um, to be simplistic, I love them. That's where I start. It it's just has to start. <clears throat> it has to start with that sense of <clears throat> of affection and love. So you know, their parents love them theoretically. That we hope <laughs> they come in. Um, but you know what it means in that context is to. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the word that you used earlier is 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 just as good a word as as love, because love can seem a little bit um, amorphous to some people. But that sense of joy. So, I think people who work with kids and want to help them develop that sense and that confidence that gives them the spirit to want to defend themselves if they ever had to do so physically, um, is to delight in the children. And and you know. You get in, you know, some children in my class, as with every children's class, really easy to deal with, and some are really difficult. So I try to make the point of taking them all in equally and finding delight, even in the ones who present as more difficult. One thing that's been really nice over the years for me is since I haven't tended to focus my kids' instruction on competition, you know, we don't tend to go to tournaments and go chasing after the trophies, is... I've been able to have a program that's a little bit more relaxed. There's not the stress of having to prepare for upcoming competitions. So what I found over the years is that I'll get a lot of kids coming to the program who have some real challenges. Kids who find that it doesn't work for them to be in a structured sports program. You know, they, they find that a little bit too overwhelming. So I'll get kids with Tourette's syndrome. I'll get kids with autism. I'll get kids with this, that, and the other thing. And you know, to my delight, they feel like they all, they all have a place there. They can all fit there. They're not expected to, to fit into any one particular mold. So, yeah, to get back to your original question, to help them develop that sense of themselves, that's develop that self that's really worth standing up for and defending, it all starts with delight, just showing that, you know, whoever you are, you walk through my door, you are valued, where you belong here. Let's let's kind of bring it not quite full circle, but almost. Mm -hmm. You talked about assisting with the kids class when you were a child yourself and the instructor handing that over to you because you didn't really enjoy it. It it sounds like your love for teaching children has grown rather than just kind of stayed stagnant. And in that case, it makes me think maybe you have some ideas for people listening who don't enjoy teaching children as much as you do, are there things that they might do differently? Is there a mindset shift you might encourage that may help them move closer to enjoying it rather than, again, this is mm. how we pay the bills? Yeah. yeah, it's tricky because, you know. Uh, I hearken back to your comment earlier that there do seem to be folks when it comes to kids who really love it and who really hate it. So in a sense, it's easy for people like me who have always um, had an easy affinity uh, with kids. But you're right. You know, there are practicalities in, in a dojo that, it, you know, historically it's, it is the kids who pay the bills. And so if you're an instructor who doesn't feel drawn to that but you feel like you need to offer that <clears throat> just to have a well-rounded school or to pay the bills you said um that's a tough one um mindset how do you change a mindset i guess one thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is rather than start with one's assumptions of what kids are and how kids behave and what can happen or what can't happen, you know, based on your assumptions is to maybe start either externally or just internally in an internal dialogue with yourself. Every time a new child comes into your school to ask two questions, who are you and what is it you want? 
because I think our agendas as instructors, our agendas can really get in the way. You know, we all have a agenda. We have curriculum. We have <laughs> bills to pay. There's all the stuff. We have our own identity as an instructor. And we think we should be as an instructor. But I think if people remember, whether it's, you know, an eight-year-old or an 88-year-old coming into a class for the first time, and whether it's Aikido or Tai Chi, you know, the art doesn't really matter, is to say, all right, well, who, who are you? You know, who, who is this new child? Who, who exactly are you? And what is it you want? Because I think if a child comes in, you know, your, your question is about how to get over some resistance or reluctance or tension in teaching children. I think if you allow children to show you and tell you who they are and what they're looking after, then the children are going to be starting from a place where they're taking more delight in the process. So, the, you know, the image that comes to me is often, <coughs> you know, one of my tropes about little kids is when it comes to the difference between boys and girls, when I have new students, I say, oh, okay. When they show up at a dojo, it seems to me like girls want to learn martial arts. Boys want to do martial arts. Mm. <laughs> so in the beginning, so in the beginning, in my you know, my bit of a gender stereotype here, when the boys come in, uh, because I've never actually had a female student do this, the boys will come in and they'll say, "Oh, this is karate. Let me let me show you karate. I'm going to show you a kick. I'm going to show you a punch." And inward my eyes are rolling into the back of my head you know it's, they're going to show me something they saw from some power rangers cartoon um but you know and that used to irritate me a little bit it's like you know come on come on we gotta get on with the lesson like you know you don't you don't know jack the kid let me <laughs> <laughs> you know just just shut up and let me show you real karate. Let's go. Okay. but then i realized up then, wait 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 when they're saying that to me they're really excited you know, it's like my own kids, you know, who, you know, if they come in the house and say, you know, Papa, Papa, look at this. And I'm in the middle of washing dishes now. But I have to, as a parent, I have to remind myself, all right, stop, turn around. You know, what this child is showing you is really important to this child. And if I can pause and take that in and acknowledge it and share a little bit of that delight, then we're going to have a good relationship. Things can go somewhere. I think the same thing can happen when children show up at classes for a dojo that, that you know they may have they may have their own notions and you don't in your in your eagerness to get on with your own agenda you don't have to squelch that you know you can make a little room by asking those questions like all right who who are you you know what's important to you um you know tell me a little bit about yourself and what do you want um you know i think that's that's a question that's sometimes missing in adult classes as well as kids' classes for the instructor to be able to say, um, what is it you want out of the class? I remember years ago when, uh, when Sensei Trim, my instructor, had an older woman come into class in her 60s. <coughs> and she, you know, 60s is not old. Now that I'm 54, 60, very young. Um, <laughs> as I it's all relative. As I approach it quickly. Um, but at the time, you know, he, he did the wise thing. He asked her, oh, you know, what's, you know, what are you looking for from class here? He didn't want to assume she was there for self-defense or for exercise, right? That he's just sincerely interested in knowing. And she told him, and as it turned out, she practiced with us for a few months and then she stopped. And that was her plan all along. She didn't plan to be a long-termer. She just decided, you know, I'm here and I want to explore it. I want to learn a little something. And then when I'm done, I'm done. And when she finished her time at the dojo, she was happy. He was happy. Um, but, you know, he, he made that important distinction. He didn't just assume that's what she wanted. So I think when it comes to kids, for your original question, um, you know, take the time. Be able to find that pause button on your own agenda. Um, because you might find that, to your surprise, kids might actually delight you if you give them the chance Now, through all this, you're teaching. But at, at the beginning, much of what we talked about, or really the heart of what we talked about, was your own training and you seeking, looking for things. 
Mm -hmm. Are you still looking? I am still looking. And one thing I feel blessed by is that, you know, I have a natural curiosity <clears throat> about things. So <clears throat> when I first started, you know, that first Kempo class back as a 15 year old, I was curious enough to say yes to my friend at the high school locker and say, yeah, why not? I'll go to a class. I'll see what's up there. And then as I progressed and went to different geographical areas, I retained enough curiosity to say, oh, there's no karate school in this area, but there's an Aikido school. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll try that. Um, you know, being open to some, some different approaches. So I guess I would say that I'm seeking without a distinct sense of what I'm seeking. So I like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but I like the notion of pursuit. You know, if somebody has something to offer that seems valuable, you know, I want to hear about it. I want to, I want to try it out a little bit. And, and things do, I think if you retain that sense of curiosity, things do build on each other. So for example, as I mentioned, <clears throat> five years ago, I started up with Tai Chi, which I had just dabbled in a tiny bit before. And now I've got this great affection for, for Tai Chi. I've become this Tai Chi evangelist. You know, I keep walking around telling everyone that they should try it. Um, and it's been this, this wonderful new thing that I can, I can seek. I can seek it. And so as I explore more of the ideas and concepts in Tai Chi, I feel it winds right back to my karate practice. Oh, this is really interesting. This, I'll bet this thing in Tai Chi is where that karate move came from. And so I continue to make these connections um, as I continue to explore, you know, the Tai Chi in particular. Um, so I think, you know, as I said early on, you know, as I got out of high school and I had that first fresh, you know, ink still dripping black belt, um, you know, thinking that, oh, at least now I feel like I'm, I'm serious about things. I'm hoping that I retain that curiosity and that sense of searching um, until the day I die. Uh, the thing that's different, I think, about me now as a 54-year-old is feeling feeling like I've got a, a pleasant pace about it that I feel like I can explore and I can practice and I can try things out um, but without a really powerful agenda. You know, I don't feel like I need to be the best at something. I don't feel like I need a particular trophy for something or a particular title. Uh, it's, it's just fascinating. It's just fascinating. I know. I love it. Mm. Oh, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> cool. What if people want to get a hold of you? How do if they do people that? want to get a hold of me, probably the, the best way is through uh, the website for the, I, I'm currently teaching my program, my Tai Chi and the, the kids program through uh, something called Open Door Workshop, which is a, a health and wellness facility up here in White River Junction. It's a, it's a great little spot. We have folks like me doing massage therapy. We have acupuncturists. We have a physical therapist, nutritional therapy. Then we have a variety of classes, dance classes, yoga, Tai Chi, the kids' martial arts. And uh, I think I sent you the link for the the website mm -hmm. I, see, I see that um, one notes so if you go to the website um and you click on practitioners you can you can find my contact information there cool. awesome. yeah and if people you know listening to this podcast have any interesting thoughts about you know what i was talking about or the populations i'm working with um you know i'm certainly happy to engage in in some discussion about uh, about any of that over email or things like that nice we've in one sense gone all over the place today and yet in another way i, I think it's been a really uh, directed conversation it's not the right word cohesive conversation and that's cohesive, not to say that other conversations mm -hmm. that we have on this show are are, are bad I, I think most people would say that's not very cohesive it, it's a it's disparaging <laughs> it's not how i mean it Long-time listeners know I love the wanderings. Oh, they're fun. We wandered, yeah. but at the same time, we didn't really wander. We were, we were, we had a theme. We did it. We had a theme. There we go. That's a good way to say it. Yeah, we are, you're right. We did have a theme. 
<clears throat> and I'm like I said, there's just there's so many things to to explore. Yeah, so many things in martial arts. And I'm just I'm, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying this this theme and and what's coming out of it. And you know, the, after we're done here, I'm I'm going to have about four hundred follow up questions that come to mind that I could have asked you. And and we're going to wind down here in a moment, but I, I I'd like to give you one more. Sure. And it's maybe it's the easiest question I can ask, but I think it's also the most important because we have this theme, because you have this almost track philosophically anyway, that you've been on, you know, you talked a bit about age and, and how things change over time. So let's fast forward the tape. You look out 10, 20, 30 years when you yeah. are in this age group of those folks that you're enjoying working with, if we were to sit down, you know, I, I come, I come visit you in the, in, in the home, the same <laughs> facility that, that, that they're in, you know, uh, hope, hopefully you're not there, but let's, let's if I can afford it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's one of those. Okay. <laughs> Let, let's, let's say you're there and, you know, martial arts radio is still going 30 years later and we're on yeah. episode, you know, 14 million. And I come to sit down with you and we have a chat and what would you hope you would be telling me about where this path, this theme has taken you up to then. Yeah, I love that question. That's a, it's a great question. It's, I feel like I could answer that, you know, in a very mm. honest and sincere way. I can answer it in a comical way. <laughs> and you, you can, the first you can do all the above if you want. <laughs> first image I had is, you know, my 85 year old self would hope that sort of out behind the parking lot, I would have uh, snuck in a little makiwara. <laughs> <laughs> and just after my afternoon, you know, jello snack, I can go out and bam, bam. I love with it. My, uh, I love with it. my, with my, my, with my old hand there. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I feel like, uh, like I think so many of your listeners to have found their passion in the martial arts. I feel like a lifer. Mm. So, you know, again, I'll, I'll liken it to my massage profession. People have asked me because I've been doing massage therapy full time now for 28 years. And, you know, it's a vigorous profession. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of wear and tear in the body, but I'm feeling great doing it. Good. And people say, Oh, we you know when do, you, when do you think you might retire? When do you think you might stop? And I, retire. It hasn't even occurred to me. It really hasn't occurred. I can see tapering, but I don't see retiring because I do have this fascination with it and this passion for it. Um, so yeah, maybe, you know, at age 84, I'd, you know, I'd be six years into a new capoeira practice. Uh, uh, <laughs> if you can picture that. I, I love it. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> no, I, you know, one of the most inspiring things I see when I float around social media is to find these old clips of, you know, 87 year old Okinawan still breaking boards and things like that, you know, and then, you know, they break three or four boards and then they, you know, go lie down for a nap for three hours, but they're still doing it. You know, they're, so I want to, I want to still be at it and I still want to be sharing it because I think to me, what's more important than the art, the arts and any of the details of the arts is what I alluded to earlier, <laughs> that sense of, sharing the community you know as i as i said earlier to me the martial arts doesn't make sense outside of the communal context that it can never be an individual pursuit it's not a team sport exactly you know, like soccer or basketball but what it is is it's a way to commune and communicate and to share something with other people um you know the to me the most important phrase in martial arts that I've learned is one of the mottos of uh, Jigoro Kano, the judo founder, which is Jita Kyoe, which is the principle of mutual benefit. So when you're practicing arts, you know, in his philosophy, all, you know, that, that, that rising tide floats all boats, that the whole point of your practice is to help yourself improve and to help all of the folks you're training with improve too. So when I teach kids classes, for example, I'll say to the kids from time to time, 
what's your first job? What's your most important job in this class? And they'll have these wonderful answers like, oh, to, to focus, pay attention, you know, learn the kata. And to me, those, those are not the primary answers. They say, no, your most important job is to make sure that all of your classmates are okay. You know, you need to make sure first and foremost that you're all doing well, that you're all in this together. And if we can establish that, then we can learn kata and we can focus and we can pursue all those other things. But we're in this together. And so I hope, you know, when I'm 85 years old, training somewhere, I hope I'm not doing it alone. I have to say, one of the things that has really stuck with me since we closed the conversation of this episode is this idea of the similarities between working with young kids and older adults. There's something that really interests me in there. And I'm looking forward to the next time I teach both groups because I, I want to see if I can bring even an ounce of the joy out in working with those folks that Sensei Como talked about today. So, sir, thank you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for doing all the things that you do. If you want show notes, they're probably in your podcast app but they're also at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to find the photos and the videos and the social media and the website links and all that good stuff. If you're down to support us in all of our work, well, you do have some options. You could leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help out with our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Did you know we have a free flexibility program? And you can get it with all of our programs at either whistlekickprograms.com or if you want to grab programs and throw a discount code on top of it, whistlekick.com. But the Flex program is totally, absolutely, 100% free. If you've got feedback, whether it's topic or guest suggestions, ways we can improve, or you want to say, hey, you did this really well, we want to hear it. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, Train hard, smile, and have a great day.